to me. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. It looked like it, it looked crazy and fun. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was uh, it was an interesting project to be part of for sure. And that we'll, we'll we'll talk all about that. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Okay. It looked like it looked crazy and fun. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was fun. It was uh, it was an interesting project okay. to be part of. Open it at the same time. Yeah, it was pretty amazing. Awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to a few technical things, but and for the people <laughs> watch my show, technical difficulties are on the regular for sure. I mean, because uh, especially when you try to do music through live streaming, there's no no shortage, no shortage of it. So today I am honored to have with me Brittany Bristow. Hi, Brittany. How are you? Hi, Paul. I'm good. I'm so happy to be here with you. you Thanks for asking me to do this. Yeah, well, it came together in such a, a, a peculiar, funny way. <laughs> you know, one of, of course, your co-star, obviously, is mm-hmm. Nally, who I was on the show, uh, One Calls a Heart With, for uh, f- uh, five years. And actually, they came on Amazing. a few years ago. So yeah. so I heard that you were doing this, this Hallmark movie, and I actually was speaking to your dad, and I did not know <laughs> that your dad had his hands in so many amazing like creative projects and uh yeah yeah so you did you grow up in an like did you grow up with that all around you were they producing and doing things when you were a kid a bit so my um my dad was an artist and a singer he uh he actually went to the american academy of dramatic arts in pasadena um, that was his formal training as an actor and he uh he did musicals and broadway stuff and the phantom and the phantom of the opera and he has this entire incredible world of um performing and he started moving more into production when i was i think probably around four or five years old he started working with a production company in toronto and uh, i think he sort of always missed being more on the creative side of things so he started finding ways that he could you know incorporate the more creative side of producing um, into his world and then always really wanted to direct and started directing and developing projects. And my mom was actually a social worker and, um, she started writing when I was quite young and she developed a number of, um, book series for education for university and and high school students. And then, uh, at some point my parents decided that it would be a great idea to turn her educational series, uh, of workbooks essentially into a series to teach young people about things like peer pressure and bullying and stuff like that and so they turned it into a tv series and uh it's still used today in a lot of high schools for a fun educational practice and uh and then she started writing more seriously and then they started developing scripts together and just sort of took off Wow. But yeah, I was I was quite young when they were when they were doing that. And the first movie we ever worked on together was one called Blizzard, which was my very first Christmas movie ever. And I was 11 when I did that one. Was that a Hallmark movie? No, no. This one was um, an independent project. It was directed by uh, LeVar Burton. Christopher Plummer played Santa Claus. Wolfie Goldberg was the voice of uh, Blizzard. Kevin Pollack is a hilarious elf in the movie. And uh, Brenda Blethyn plays the aunt uh, in the movie. And it's uh, it's now considered a Christmas classic. It's been playing wow. every year on NBC for Christmas. And yeah, I get a lot of messages around Christmas time saying, are you that really mean girl in that Christmas movie? Oh, you're, you were a mean, <laughs> was that, and it's your first movie, you were a, a mean, you were mean oh, in it? I was the bully, yeah. Really? I mean, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. It was fun though. Fun to I play bet. a meanie. <laughs> like that. And so you're 11, just back us up just a little bit before that. So mm-hmm. you were, you were a figure skater and a dancer. Yeah. Is that right? And then how did yeah, that, yeah. that's actually, you know, Andrea Brooks, someone calls her heart. She was a, a competitive figure skater too. And she yeah. wanted to go on an audition and it, and you know, and it's a, this one audition sort of changed her life. So how, how did you train? How did you, other than growing up in a family of, of obviously artists and and your parents doing this that's got to help a lot but did did you was there an age where you're like I need to act or is it how did did, you just fall into it what happened it's actually pretty funny so um 
I started dancing really, really young. I think my parents were like, this girl's hyper. Let's put her in some things where she can get that action out. <laughs> um, so I started doing ballet classes when I was like three. Of course, when you're three, you're just running around a room screaming the wheels on the bus in a tutu. And it's like, oh, I'm dancing. Um, oh. But I, I stayed with my with my ballet classes. And when I was about six, um, someone came into the studio and essentially pulled my teacher aside and said, hey, we're looking to cast some little girls for a for a bank commercial. Um, so, you know, if any of these girls want to come, we're going to do an open casting call. And I overheard it and I just went, TV, the commercial, I could be in a commercial. And I lost it. And I went home and I was like, please, please let me do this. Please let me go. Please let me go. And I think I just harassed my parents until finally they were like, hey, we'll take you to the audition. Of course, I don't think they were expecting that I would book it. Nice. Um, and I did. And then I proceeded to announce to my parents that I was going to be an actor for the rest of my life um, mm. at six years old. And uh, apparently I, I really knew what I wanted to do with my life because yeah. here we are. <laughs> and your, res your resume, Brittany, is so long. I was looking and, and it's so like very active in so many different years. It was such an impressive a resume and, and it's, I love how many how many things you're doing now too there's a lot of and then you have a nature show that we're going to talk about for a minute yeah. here in, in a in a in a moment so you were it's a, and then you went to the national ballet as the, the Canadian National yeah. Ballet School was where you did. were you also taking acting at that time you're six years wait you're <laughs> six know. years old you're six years <laughs> old so I, I acted, I did a lot of commercials and stuff. I did a couple of films. Um, and then when I was 12, I auditioned, uh, I was transitioning schools anyways. And I was bullied a lot as a kid. I think a lot of people who end up in the arts sort of have that for some reason, like it, it, it forces us into finding other things that make us joyful. And um, at least that's sort of something I've noticed. Um, mm. But I was transitioning schools. So my parents were really open to where I would go. I sort of had an opportunity. I was very lucky in that my parents were open to looking at private schools and performing schools. And you know, if I wanted to go to the, to the middle high school um, that was available to me publicly, that was fine as well. But um, I started sort of just looking at my options and uh, we went to go see the Nutcracker at Christmas and there were little girls running around handing out pamphlets to audition for the National Ballet School. And I thought, well, I love dance. Why not? They teach you everything and you get to dance at the same time. So I auditioned and let me tell you, I have no idea why I was accepted. I ran into, I'm not even kidding. I ran into a ballet bar during my audition and I broke my toe open and it was just gushing blood all over the studio. My, my body suit broke. I didn't know where I was going. I was so confused and I got in and I was like, oh, what these people seeing me, but like uh, a mess apparently is a good idea for this. <laughs> this wow. Um, so and so you're, wait, how, old, how old are you at this moment? 12. 12. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So then I spent six years at the National Ballet School um, studying and I graduated from the professional program. Um, and then when I was 18, I, I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to keep pursuing dance, but I also wanted to sort of dip my toes back into auditions because I missed acting so much. Mm. And um, I ended up running back into the film industry full force. Wow. So. I was very lucky that it, that it, you know, it was willing to bring me back in as well. Cause it can be really tough to find your way, especially yeah. as a young adult, like not really knowing who you are or where you fit in the industry. It was, I felt very lucky. So. And you mentioned bullying. I, um, it's such an, it's such a, it, it's so frustrating that it's such a casual mm -hmm. mention in a conversation. I know. Like this, right. Like, especially in the arts, um, you know, I, I, I grew up in an athletic kind of environment, so I wasn't aware of the bullying because I, it was yeah. probably my peers that were bullying. I don't remember being a bully, but I do know that, you know, the jocks and that they were like intimidating the artists and the, and there was mm -hmm. like a smoker's door, which is where I would, yeah. I would like sneak into my drama classes because I didn't want to be associated <laughs> with the <laughs> arts people, but I don't. Yeah. What was that like? So you you obviously turned the bullying into something that you would overcome. But like, what yeah. what what do you think that is that allowed you to take that? Because some people, if when they're bullied, it'll it'll make their life go 
like in a really negative direction. So what, yeah. why do you think you were able to turn it into something that was actually powerful for you? Um, I really genuinely believe that a big reason why it ended up being such a positive for me was because my mom and dad noticed. Um, of course, as kids, like you never really say anything. And I had really wonderful support system in my teachers as well. Like a lot of my teachers noticed. And I think for me, it was just one of those things where I did have friends. It was just that a lot of the friends that I had were sort of, you know, they, they wanted to be a part of the quote unquote cool group. And it, it wasn't that I was bullied by everybody, but it was definitely a noticeable thing. Like I would sit by myself at recess. So then as I got older, instead of going outside for recess, I'd say like, Hey, do you mind if I like organize the basketballs in the gym? So I would stay inside and like not have to deal with the fact that I was sort of alienated from a group. Um, or at lunchtime, I would volunteer to like answer the phones in the principal's office. And eventually my mom, I lived really close to my school growing up. Um, and my mom was walking my childhood dog and she saw me sitting by the fence by myself. And she walked over and she was like, why aren't you with your friends? And I was like, oh, I don't, um, I don't, I don't know. She's like, mm. why? Brittany, why aren't you playing with your friends? And I was like, I don't have any. <laughs> so then my mom made, like, took it upon herself to bring me home for lunch every day, which impacted her career. It impacted her dreams, but she made it her mission. Like every single day I came home for lunch. If I had somebody that I thought was somebody I wanted to be friends with, I was allowed to invite them over without having to clear it with my mom. Like any day of the week, there was always anybody was allowed to come home with me for lunch as long as it was cleared by their parents. And she just really made it a big effort um, mm -hmm. to bring me home. But the other thing was because I was involved in all of these extracurricular activities, because yeah. as a child, I was so energetic. My parents wanted me to have that, that outlet. I was really, really lucky in that I had such a great circle, especially with my skating friends. Like I, one of my best friends growing up, I still know her. She has two kids now. She's, you know, she's the stepmom to two other kids and we still chat. And, you know, we became friends when I was seven. And mm -hmm. so I had friends, they just weren't necessarily in the place where I spent all of my like learning years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think, I think a really big part of that was my sister was like just my best friend and, and my mom and dad really, they, when they found out they under no circumstances was I spending a day at school by myself at lunch, I was coming home. I was feeling special. I was, you know, oh. they, they wanted to make sure that I didn't feel like I had nothing or, or no one, or had to make excuses as to why I wouldn't be around people. Um, so it made it really exciting for me. And it meant that I got to spend time with my parents and my mom would like take me for ice cream once a month for, mm. for our lunch date. And like, I looked forward to that every day instead of worrying about where I was going to go or if anybody was going to talk to me and that wow. definitely helped. Yeah. Wow, wow. That is such a, that's such a wild thing. And you said it impacted your mom's career. How like it just, cause she was, didn't have as much time to do like what she needed. She was like, yeah. Time, or? yeah. I mean like any pursuits that she had, she had to go, okay, well I have to go pick up Brittany at lunch. So I have to be home by 1145. So I can go get her for 12 and then I have to have her at home till one. And then I walk her back to school. So from 1145 yeah. to 115, her day was interrupted. And then of course mm -hmm. she was picking me up at 330. So yeah. where she would normally spend that day working, you know, yeah. half of that time that she had to herself was interrupted. So, um, you know, definitely, I, I know it impacted her, but I know she wouldn't change it for anything. She's no, of course. the best mom like, ever. And she, you know, she had the ability to do it, which was lucky. Yeah. And, and your sister is, how old is your sister? My sister's 42. She's 10 years older than me. Okay. Um, so you guys, she, she yeah. was long gone from middle school. Like she, I didn't mean how old yeah. is she today. Sorry. I was, I, was, I don't, I know better than to ask a woman's name. You just, like, you just threw the age out there. So oh, yeah, you, no. you have no issue with it. Good. Uh, yeah. So she's 10 years older than you. So she wasn't yeah. there to like see. You. No. Yeah. So that was part of it. Like when I was eight, my sister moved away to Montreal and went to school there. So, um, you know, I had her to talk to and I had her to write like little pen pal letters with, but, mm. um, but when I was really little, like my sister took care of me all the time. She loved babysitting me. We were best buds. We still are. I love her so much, oh. but the age difference definitely like we weren't at school to keep each other protected. So no, no, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I have a 20 year gap or 18 year gap between my new, I have a three month old and my son's mm -hmm. 18. So it's a, that's amazing. 
it's a big, <laughs> it's a big gap. That's a very uh, big gap. And so what, do, what takes you then from there all to New York to, to study with Larry Moss? Like that's not a small end. And also, no. you know, at the New York, the, the, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts is where? Mm-hmm. Is that in New York? Is that with Larry Moss? Yeah. Or is that another place? So they're separate, um, but there's two, two different, uh, campuses. There's one in Los Angeles and one in New York. The one in Los Angeles was the one that my dad went to. Um, but I auditioned. Yeah. But I auditioned for the one in New York when I, when I left high school, like I said, I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go next. Um, but I knew I more likely than not wanted to study acting. I knew the idea of going to New York and having the opportunity to learn from people who were studying for, you know, these incredible plays on Broadway and, Um, All of that was something that was very interesting to me. I auditioned for um, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, the Stella Adler School of Performing Arts, um, NYU, but I auditioned for NYU NYU as a dancer. Um, And then I also auditioned for the Juilliard program. Um, I did not get into Juilliard, which is A-OK because it's Juilliard. Um, I auditioned for that program as a dancer. Um, and then NYU I got into, but it was funny because I think that was sort of the nail in the coffin of the career of my, my dance world was I got into NYU on a scholarship for all three or four years, however long the program is. And I was like, I don't want to (sighs) go. I was like, you, I'm sorry, you have a fully paid scholarship as a dancer to the NYU Tisch School of the Arts. Like, why don't you want to go? And I was like, I don't want to do it anymore. Wow. So it was like really definitive in my head after that. I was like, oh, if I don't want to go to this prestigious school where I could be around these performers and do this amazing thing, like I clearly don't want to dance anymore. That's my career. And so that, did you, you knew you wanted to act or is that the main? Yeah. 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 I, Cause in my head, I was even like, well, if I get in on a scholarship for dance, maybe I could like transition to the drama program. Like everything in my head was thinking of how I could navigate it so that I could d- act mm. rather than dance. Like you wow. do I use my skills in dance to get in so that I can act like, I, but that doesn't your, make any sense. <laughs> what did your parents say? what did your parents say when you're like, Hey, I'm pulling out of NYU. Uh, I, I just, how, 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 how'd that phone call go? Well, I mean, it's funny, actually, my parents came with me to New York when I had all of my auditions. And after I got my acceptances to certain places, they were like, well, how do you feel like NYU would be incredible? It's your dance and all this. And I was like, I just, I don't know why, but I just don't, I just don't want to go. And they were, they were really supportive. I mean, obviously, they knew I loved ballet. So for them, they were kind of like, are you sure? you love this but I I knew I missed acting more than I than I loved ballet and I just said I have to do I have to pursue acting I have to give it a try and if it doesn't work I'll keep going to classes I'll keep dancing you know I'll I'll teach I'll I'll do all that just to keep myself active in the world of dance but I think I just need to kind of jump in and and see because I'm always going to wonder if maybe I missed my calling and then um, how and so. when you when you turned that down, how long was it before you booked something where you're or that you knew you're like, oh, I made the right decision here? Like, how was there a was there a big <laughs> gap between that? I mean, honestly, <clears throat> I, <laughs> I don't know that there was like a definitive moment. I um, I booked a TV series when I was nineteen, and that was a pretty big deal for me. I okay. was actually at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts doing their summer program. Um, when I got the call that I booked the TV show because I got into the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and then um, there was a film that I had developed uh, sort of kind of as an actor with my parents and with a writer um, when I was about 14, 15 um, that ended up being made when I was 21. Um, What's that called? But it's called Sophie and Shiva. Okay. It's a movie about a, a ballerina who runs away to the circus. Um to save an elephant that her parents rescued when she was little. They work on a a rescue zoo sort of thing. Um, It was a very cute story, but because I had the dance background, that was sort of this, this sort of dream of being able to incorporate both into my world. But when I graduated from high school, um, it looked like everything was going to be going forward. And I had this opportunity to make this movie that I'd been so impassioned with for so many years or go to school. And I thought, okay, I can put my acceptance on a deferral and I can come back to this. So I'll do that. 
but then the filming got pushed and it interfered with me being able to go. So I auditioned for their summer program and I went and did their Shakespeare intensive program. And while I was there, I got a call. I was re-auditioning for the school so that I could go back for their September semester. And then I got a call that I booked um, a new lead in a, in a small TV show in Canada. And I was like, well, now I don't know what to do either. But they say like, sometimes, you know, I think there's such value in training, but also any natural instincts you have can kind of get interrupted. And if I was being booked on my natural instincts, then maybe the move was to try. Um, because I think you can always learn, but you can't always get the job back. So in mm. my head, that was sort of the rationale. And so I just was like, okay, I guess I'm going to do this TV show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I did that. And then I never ended up going to the full program. Um, but I did uh, make studying a very big part of the path. And I've, I've put a lot of time and effort into making sure that I get to go and study with people who really know, um, because it's important to me to, to understand the career I'm, I'm diving into. Um, like with dance, they say, you know, anything, if you study anything for 10,000 hours, it makes you a pro at it. Uh, yeah, and I spent 10,000 hours. In yeah. dancing, you'd be worn out with injuries and like <laughs> yeah, falling over 10,000. Also that, also that, but it is sort of that thing. Like <clears throat> I spent six years of my life dancing four hours a day on average. Uh -huh. um, and every day in the summer, all day. Yeah. It's kind of like, okay, well, I spent all those years studying to become good at something. So if I want to be good as an actor, I can't just say, oh, I'm just going to go act. I have to right. like, you know, I have to put in the time. I have to work with people who are really knowledgeable, who know way better than I ever will. And so I've made it a really big part of my, of my learning curve. And I, I try to continue with acting classes and everything as often as I can. Of course, with COVID, it's been possible. But yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, there's some actors, right. That you hear the rare person that never took acting lessons. Mm -hmm. then, like for me, that's like somebody who doesn't go to the gym. I, I <laughs> even if you're blessed with an yeah. amazing physique, you should probably train it. Like, and, and yeah. that's, that's what acting class is for me. It's like, yeah. I, I've been doing one on online uh, throughout the whole pandemic just, mm -hmm. and it's done with zoom. And most of our, like this, most of, meetings and auditions and everything is done like this so doing a class yeah. through zoom is actually really quite valuable because you're yeah this is now how we get booked for jobs really if, absolutely if you're not offered something or if it's like a meeting like this so mm -hmm. um do, what do you what is your technique like when you act like let's say you get a script sent to you do you do a, are you a lengthy, like, do you have to break it all down or do you like, I know these things probably evolve and change from, from project yeah. to project, but do you have something that you love that, that helps you get ready? Yeah. So I love the preparation process. You so do. Much. Okay. I do. Okay. Yeah. Why? Why? I think for me, it's about uncovering who the person is that I'm playing, because I think one thing, one in just incredibly valuable thing that my acting coach Larry Moss said to me or said to the class but of course I'm like yes my rules from now on forever okay I take that for me um one thing he said was every act every character that you play deserves just as much, much respect as any person because they are a person mm -hmm. it's up to you to bring them to life mm -hmm. they're already ready written they're already fully right. formed they're just not alive yet because they don't have a body to live in. So for me, whenever I'm doing my prep, it, I look for all of the hints in the writing. I look for all of those little bits, you know, did the person have a breakup five years ago? Okay. What did that look like? What was that person's name? You don't have that information, search for it in the script. If you can't find it, create it. So you have those memories, you have that emotion, you have those feelings. So for me, I go through and I just, I'm, I'm working on a project um, starting May 3rd and I got the scripts and I immediately just started typing and typing and typing. And I go through and I look at every single scene and I write sort of the internal dialogue for the whole script because we're talking, but there's always something else going on inside of our heads. Mm -hmm. When you're in the middle of a conversation, you're always thinking of something. There's always a reason behind what's coming out. So for me, I try to go through and go, okay, well, if I'm having this conversation, what am I actually thinking? And if I'm actually thinking this, why am I thinking that? And I love to kind of go through and figure out all of those little things so that I can create somebody who's like fully a human, fully formed, who has this whole 
dynamic so that no matter what scene you throw them into, they have a way of presenting themselves and of reacting to things. And I think it's, it's so fun to just like build a person. You've got all these Lego pieces. It's just up to you to put them together to make something that that's real. Um, so I love, I love the prep. Do you do, and are, are you an, are you an organized person or do you find yourself doing things like last minute and do you, no. have those, do you ever have nightmares where you don't know your lines? Do you ever have those? Yes, nights? all the time. Why? Like, but I'll have them, I'll have them about something that I'm not even working on. Like I'll have a nightmare oh, yeah. in the middle of the week and it's like, I've got an audition and in my brain, I'm trying to memorize these lines that I've never seen before of a script I've got no knowledge of. And I wake up and I'm like, I don't know any yeah. this, yeah. That's not real. I, I wonder, I wonder if, I wonder if that, that must be an actor thing because yeah. it's like, there's the dreams when you're not wearing pants at school as a kid, <laughs> which I had all the time. I don't know why I was yeah. always, na- I was always naked in my dreams at school in front of, in front of people. And now as an adult, it's not always, but there's times if I'm getting ready for a movie and where I can't find the script in my yeah. dream. And I'm yeah. like, how, and then I'm beating myself up in the dream going, how can I be so unprofessional that I don't know where the script is? I am shooting yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I completely understand. I feel like I have that too. It's just like an absolute paranoia for me. I also cannot sleep the night before the first day of filming. I don't oh, know about you. Brutal. I can't. But I am awake all night and I'm just like, oh. no, still awake. <laughs> all right, I guess I'll just go to set with three minutes of sleep under my belt and hope I do a good job. That, that's intense. And then you would have, the brain doesn't memorize so well or remember things with no sleep. No. Have you ever had a first day? Yeah. Do you just tell everyone, you're like, listen, I just don't sleep the night before. This could go, this could go. (laughs) Only if things are going badly. (laughs) Right, right, right. You can lean on that. So what's this I hear about you turning up with your makeup done so that other people would uh, tell me about that? Like what what made you you're not you're you're the furthest thing from a prima donna, which is which is what I've heard. Uh, Where did that come from? Like, you know, like why what would have you get up early to do your makeup so that you would get to work ready to go and not be taking up other people's time? Like, tell me about that characteristic in you. Where do you think that comes from? Cause that's obviously it tells me you're thoughtful. You're, you know how to make it about other people, which, which mm. from my perspective makes a good actor when it's, when it's all about you, it's very boring to watch an actor that's <laughs> self-absorbed agree. or a person, a person. You know, yeah. and just like your your teacher Larry Moss said, uh, it's you know, there's it's the same thing. Whatever you're mm-hmm. doing, it's if you want the compassion to get to know a real person, you want to have that compassion to get to know your character. But what yeah. is where does that come from in you? Um, well, makeup wise, I've, I think I've only ever done the makeup for the Wildlife series. That was just to make sure that when we had to get running in the morning, we were good to go because I trust the makeup professionals far too much to do anything to my own head most of the time but there have been a couple of times where hair for example just takes too long so I'll say like okay we're curling my hair every day great I'll get up at five I'll curl my whole head and then you guys can style it and it's already like done Mm -hmm. um and in part it's just for me it's everybody has such I mean I know you know we have such limited time on set to get ready to prepare to do all of those things so I try to go in as ready as humanly possible. I get up a little extra early in the morning. I make sure that if there's anything that I can do, if it's putting on foundation or curling my hair or whatever, I've done that so that the people who are pressed for time, especially hair and makeup, they have an opportunity to go, okay, great. So the 20 minutes I would have spent curling Britney's hair, I now don't have to do. So I can take more time to develop something that is, that is, you know, exactly the way I want her to look. And I'm not frantically trying to pin it after I've curled it because I've only got 25 minutes. It's little things like that. And I think to, you know, like going in every morning and saying, okay, great. This is my costume. I'm just going to put it on. I'm not going to ask if I need to put it on. I'm just going to get ready. I'm going to step into my trailer. I'm going to walk out of my trailer fully good to go. So that nobody had to say, Hey, we've got five minutes to go to set. We need to get you dressed. Everybody's panicking. Just take that extra 
step to try to just make everyone else's life easier. Mm. Um, I think a lot of that for me comes from <laughs> I'm really eager. I love what I do. And I just like, I'm like, okay, we're here. I want to get to set. What are we going to do? How are we going to act today? Um, mm. The other side of that for me is as somebody that's worked in all facets of the film industry, I've been a producer, I've worked as an AD, I've worked as craft su supervisor, I've worked as a transport, like I've, I've taken on doing all of them just so that I could understand them all. And I understand that like, especially ADs, they are getting it from all ends because the camera department needs their space and the gaffers need time and the actors are sometimes people that need a little extra time to get dressed or need to have an opportunity to ask a question or need that extra 10 minutes in hair. And they're sort of the ones trying to micromanage everything. Mm -hmm. So if you do the little, little things to make their life easier, mm -hmm. then they have the capacity to turn around and have a way easier day just because mm -hmm. one person did one thing to take a pressure off of them. So I think that's, that's part of it for me is like, it's this, it's the little things like on set. ADs are always the person to say, hey, do you want a water? And then they go and they get the numbers and they come back with their waters. If I'm going to the, you know, water station, I'll say, hey, does anybody need a water? Because then that means that that person doesn't have to do it. Right. Um, it's, it, I don't know. It, I think it's just a matter of making sure that as an actor, you don't think your job's any more important than anybody else's because it's not. You're just the representation of everyone else's hard work. And you are conscientious of, of doing what you can to help everyone else as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes that can get a little lost. Um, so it's something that's really important to me to maintain whenever I'm on set. It's wow. Just make everybody else's life easier. I don't need to make it any harder. So yeah. like, what can I do to make it better? Yeah, I don't think a lot of actors have that approach. Um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, Canadians are over, overly quite, uh, I would say, considerate and thoughtful. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I would say in this universe of, you know, the Hallmark world and the people we work with, there's, I've, I've met very few prima donnas. I've met mostly okay. people that are like, all right, we're in this for three weeks. Let's make the best picture that I we can agree, make. Yeah. Or I guess one calls a heart. It was, uh, for us, it was longer uh, than three weeks, but we were always yeah. a part of a family and, 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 but I love that you did. It's no, but it's so important to do the, and you did it from the inside where you were an AD and you were assistant and, and to, to know what it's like when you get ignored, like when an actor, like, all right, five minutes. And there's like no response from the actor's door. And you're like, Hello, we're actually, Hello? We're, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's, yeah. that's so great. Now, did you get the opportunity to do all those different roles? Because like when you're, so you're, I'm trying to, I'm trying to merge us here because your dad, <laughs> I'm trying to bring us to current day which yeah. is a tale of love, which is, yeah. which was directed by your dad, yeah. written, written by your mom. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Starring you. And of course, Chris yeah. McNally. Uh, and so you, as what takes you from like, obviously you there's you you're, I've heard that on Hallmark, you were, you were uh, in the, not the, um, the girlfriend and a, a few, and then actually the, the Hallmark fans really rallied behind you to help yeah. Hallmark see you more as a lead. And like, can you talk about that experience a little bit to have such support yeah. from the fans and what took you from, you know, where you were studying with Larry Moss and, and then that, that, that TV series that you were talking about mm -hmm. uh, your first show and you were 19 then? Yeah, I think it was 1920. And yeah. how long how long did that show go? Only one season, which was actually, I think, ultimately a blessing in disguise because it taught me a lot, gave me an opportunity to realize I really loved what I did. And then I started training more and trying to find my footing a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the transition over the last 10, 12 years has sort of been I went back into the industry and I was really lucky right away. I got like four jobs in a row. And I was like, oh, amazing. I'm an actor now. And then I struggled and I was having trouble getting hired. And I knew that I needed to study. And I put my effort into going back to school. I studied film at University of Toronto at the Critics School, sort of like known as the place where you go to study film theory and and really understand the history of film and uh, different genres. You study filmmakers and, and film theorists. 
Um, so I went there and I started studying with Larry Moss and I got a job after leaving that program as a junior producer at a production company in Toronto, which was where I sort of started getting an opportunity to take on all roles. Um, on the film side, I worked as somebody who did uh, script coverage. So I went through it, I read scripts and I broke them down for budget um, and helped writers sort of create a script where it was really feasible in terms of what the budget was based on where they were hoping to shoot and what kind of money they were looking at. Um, and I would work with them to develop their concepts and um, make this, the characters stronger and the dialogues better. And then uh, at the same time, that production company had a commercial department and they needed help. They needed people who would come on and do catering for a day or people who would drive executives from the airport to the shoot and then back to their hotels. And they needed somebody to assist with casting and they needed somebody who would be there as an AD on a day. And I just sort of was like, put me forward for everything. I'll do all of it. I want to learn all of it. So I was kind of their odd person who, when they needed somebody, they went, Hey, Brittany, you available today? And I was like, yep, I'm going to do it. And um, after a few years of that, you know, I was obviously wanting to act, but it, it wasn't going <laughs> exactly the direction I wanted it to. So I said, okay, as my mom put it, you can't walk around a pool with one foot in the water. She said, you either have to jump in or stay on the deck. That's it. So you either jump in and try acting, give it your all, or stand on the sidelines and monitor the swimming pool. And that's great too. But you have to do one or the other because you're going to drown if you try to walk around a pool with one foot in the water. Right, right, right. So I gave my notice pretty much everywhere. And I said to the universe, okay, three months. I have three months to book a job. And if I don't, changing career directions. I'm going to pick something else. I'm going to make the official decision to not be an actor anymore. Based, and, based, on, um, a conver based on a conversation with your, <laughs> mom, with your mom. Yeah. Your mom said you can't have one foot. Like, so how, so and you're, <laughs> not, I, I'm just amazed. Like, it's not like some, some spiritual guru from India, like came upon you and, and, yeah. or, or you're in a car, like in, in a, in a <laughs> tragic life or death situation, but your mom just had a conversation with you. And that was like, yeah. that's the kind of listening you have of your, your, your mom, like your relationship. Oh, she's a smart lady. She is worth everybody listening to. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think my okay. parents knew that I really wanted to be an actor. It was what I really wanted. Yeah. And I wasn't as happy as I wanted to be. And I was like, I know something needs to change, but I don't know what that needs to be. And my mom basically said, like, take a chance on yourself. How much money do you have saved up? Go for it. Worst right. case scenario, it fails. Then you know it failed. And then you can pick something else to do. So I went, okay. Mm. So the next day I called and I gave my two weeks notice at every job I had. And I called my friend, who, the person who ran this production company, who was, of course, now my friend. I'd been working for him for three years. And I said, hey, I really want to try acting. What's the deal? And he was like, go for it. I've always known you were a good actor. I saw you and stuff when you were, you know, 19. Go for it. You're, you always have a home here. You're always welcome. But right. go for the thing that's going to make you happy. So I gave myself three months. And a week later, I booked a movie. And then in the following three weeks, I booked seven projects and I have not turned back since. And that was how it all kind of transitioned. Wow. And it was like the universe or something was listening and was like, okay, you want to give it your all? You have finally done the work. You've, you've studied with the people you've learned everything you can learn and you know, you want to do this. You're not wondering if you want to do this, mm. you know, this is what you want to do. Wow. And it just, I mean, and I know there's a lot of people who, who, would take that chance and it wouldn't work out. And it's incredibly disappointing. And I know how lucky I am that for me, something clicked. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, yeah, I booked a film that's will always sit very close to my heart called Kiss and Cry um, about a young woman who was diagnosed with cancer when she was 19. And my aunt had passed away from cancer. Um, very, very close to when I had the audition and I walked into the room and it was just like everything sort of, fell apart and I felt like I was actually in this person's life and I got to play a real person who was battling with the fact that her sister was dying and it was a really touching experience I'm still very close with the two girls who played my sisters in the movie we mm. see each other once every three months we go for dinner they're like two of my best friends um I count them as actual sisters but that was sort of the start of everything for me um 
And it just sort of all changed from there. And here I am. And I have no idea how or why mm -hmm. I got this lucky, but. Are you, you mentioned yeah. the universe ago. Are you a religious person at all? I'm not. No, I, I think, I think religion can be really beautiful in that it's something that gives people sort of a guideline. I think there's something really beautiful to that. I personally wasn't raised in a super religious family, um, but I would definitely call myself a spiritual person for sure. Uh -huh. I don't, I don't practice any one thing specifically, right. um, but uh, yeah. But you did two biblical films. What would draw I you? I did. What would draw you to do, uh, to do, to do those? And what was that experience like? They were great. I um, ultimately, I think the stories themselves are incredible. And I think that the characters I had an opportunity to play were, were two people that, you know, weren't, um, weren't focused on as historical people. Um, of course, one of the characters in those two movies was fictional. She was created as sort of a, a tool for the story. Um, but I think, you know, the stories of the Bible are, are remarkable and they teach us so much and they're so valuable. And um, so also, I think for me, there's something really incredible about being able to play a woman in another time frame who had power, who knew who she was, who was strong, who had conviction. A lot of projects that you play um, a woman who lived in another era, you're struggling with that. And so for me to play somebody from so long ago who was so passionate and knew exactly who she was and was strong and, and strong-minded and um, it, it was, it was really interesting to play somebody who knows where her place is, but also wants to challenge that. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's, it's a lot about the characters and the strength of the women, um, that draw me to the projects. Mm, that's, and that's, that's, uh, so it was, a, it was, a not a person that was actually in the story, but your, your, your person, your character was narrating sort of uh, or uh, no so in in one of them um i played a woman named johanna who was uh, that's in saul uh the journey to damascus okay. and um she's a young woman who is a follower and she um she sort of without fail allows this passion and this trust in something other than herself to lead her which i think is so beautiful mm. um she's not a huge character but she's um She's somebody that looks to Mary Magdalene as somebody that has all this passion and this belief in something that's completely intangible. And I think that that's such an incredible mm -hmm. thing to just have so much faith and so much belief in something. Um, and yeah, she sort of, you know, she loves her father and she believes what she believes and she's not really willing to give that up for anyone. And she falls in love with a young man who was injured in a war um, and has as a result he has some some issues with his speech and he's sort of this outcast and she convinces him that believing in something is more important than seeking revenge or um looking at your life as a hardship it's better yeah. to have faith in something which mm -hmm. i do believe in mm -hmm. um and uh in the other film i play a young woman who befriends peter in the final days of his life um in Rome, she's one of Nero's slaves, and that's based on a on, on a real character who was one of the very unfortunate women <laughs> to be right. part of right, Nero's right. kingdom. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, you don't yeah. think you don't think of women back then of having a lot of authority or a lot of power, especially no. when the when the narrow, when the you know, from how that time is perceived and right and rights mm -hmm. and no, like yeah, yeah. Which yeah. speaking of rights. And uh, the marijuana conspiracy. So I I, <laughs> I, I, I watched the trailer of this, and actually, yeah. the concept of it is really cool. Um, where? How long ago was that movie? Twenty nineteen. So I shot. Yeah, I shot that movie in twenty nineteen, um, and it's a really fascinating story. It's a true story. Yeah. And a, fun a segue, and a fun segue from yeah. the Bible right into right into <laughs> marijuana, the marijuana conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a really interesting story. It's a true story about a number of women who were involved in uh, in a drug experiment in Toronto in the seventies. Um, and it's you know the reason I took it on was really nothing to do with the um, with the fact that it explores drug use and what that effect has on people but the actual experiment and the manipulation of the women that were involved in this experiment these women never got the results of the experiment they were held essentially 
against their will in a building with no ability to go outside. Um, they were not given any money. They were told if they wanted to buy anything, they had to use tokens. Like they were brought into this space where they were manipulated into a token society. They were drugged beyond anything they thought they were going to be drugged to and then told to make macrame and macrame had to be done well. And then they would give their macrame to the token police, not they, that's not what they were called, but they would give their macrame over. And if it was done well, then they would receive tokens based on the projects that they'd done. And those tokens were what allowed them to purchase things like food. Like it was just bizarre. And they were held there for over 90 days. They weren't allowed to speak to their family. They weren't allowed to make phone calls. They were poked with needles so often to do blood tests that they all looked like drug addicts and had to receive doctor's notes upon leaving to say that they were not heroin addicts. Like, wow. and they were just left with no information. And then the government destroyed all of the information on the study and never released it to them, never released it to the public. And they still, to this day, are trying to uncover the results of what happened to them medically and no one will tell them. What? So it's and no one knew about it. <laughs> wow. So how, how did that come to you? How did you get that? So Craig Price, who's actually one of the writers um, and directors of Good Witch, created okay. it. He okay. read the article um, a number of years ago. One of the women from the experiment came forward and wrote an article about it. And it was in a, a, mag a, a newspaper in Toronto called the Toronto Star. And he read this article and was fascinated, especially with the fact that no one knew what it was. Wow. No one had ever heard about it. It, it, it was really was styly. I liked the way that it was yeah. filmed and, and yeah. it, looked like, it looked like, was it fun to do? It was so much fun. And it was, you know, it was one of those things too, where it was a real honor to be a part of because the women who were a part of the experiment actually did come to set and they spent a day with us. Um, their identities were protected, of course, but they they came to set and they were like this is insane like this is what it was like for us like this is what we were stuck in like oh. people were watching us and writing notes 24 7 like we had no escape um and i met a couple of really incredible women on the film i mean all of them are incredible one of course is very familiar in the hallmark world as well morgan um yeah. And uh, yeah, it was it was a really remarkable experience. And I felt very lucky knowing, especially afterwards, you know, hearing from Craig, he would say, you know, so and so wrote it wrote in and this was their experience watching it. And these real women were like, thank you so much yeah. for for sharing our story and, and for and for shining a light on something that was, you know, some of us were shunned from society as a result of it within our own communities. Some people were you know, messed up for life. There's some women who experienced extreme withdrawal, who experienced certain complications, not necessarily because of what they were putting into their bodies, but because of the circumstances that they were put into mm -hmm. um, and, and the sort of manipulation of, of their circumstances. So it was, it was a really interesting project to be a part of. And it was really fun because it was such a like, everybody cared so much about it. it was such a little project and we all kind of came together as a team and just did everything we could to, to make it the best thing we could um yeah it was cool it looked like it it looked like it yeah. was an important, important thing to do and then so how do you get mm -hmm. from that to, to hallmark <laughs> and how, like how does you know it's it's always funny it's that's a pretty fun t transition uh but that's yeah. 2019 you had already done a few hallmark movies before that obviously yeah so i started working with hallmark in 2017 my first movie for them was yeah. um, love blossoms and uh i got to play a very fun woman named kimmy who was a bit of a hyperactive uh assistant at a perfumery in belgium and uh I was very lucky to get the role and very excited when I got invited to the TCAs after doing that. Um, for those who don't know, that's the Television Critic Awards um, and Hallmark has a, a party that they throw for it every year. And um, the, oddly enough, when I got there, everyone thought I was French because I did a French accent in the movie. <laughs> everyone was like, I'm sorry, you're from where? Canada. How did, oh, how did you convince, okay. Hallmark's hard to convince to do an accent. How did you convince them to do that? You just did a good accent. I, I I just, in reading it, I was like, I can't give her an English accent. This woman has been born and raised in Belgium. She's lived here her whole life. So I'm just going to do it. So I was actually in London at the time. And um, I found through the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts, which was another school I'd auditioned for way back when, um, I found a dialect coach who specialized in 
French accents. And I worked with him for about six weeks in total, um, mm. perfecting the accent as best I could. Wow. So I thought if I'm going to do this, I have to do it right. Cause I can't mess this up. I'm being given this like golden egg opportunity and I have to do a good job. So I, uh, I did. And for whatever reason, everyone was how well impressed and happy. How well- how well did you sleep that first night? <laughs> not even a little not bit. At all. Not, no, I never sleep at all the night before. <laughs> well, what I'm hearing from you sharing, which is really impressive, is edu- like you learning in school and studying and the whole process and the preparation is and the hard work, like you call it, you call it luck. And, you know, some people would think maybe because your dad and your mom are involved in the industry that it would you know, help. And I'm sure it helps, but what I'm Mm -hmm. hearing from your journey, and these are very prestigious schools and teachers. And, and so it, it seems to me from what, from what you're sharing that the preparation and and you being really, really well prepared and not leaning on say your family or your, Mm -hmm. your looks, it's so important for you to, to dig into your, uh, into, into the, like the art, the craft of it. Um, yeah. and, and am I right? In, um, is that? Yeah. I mean, I think there's also to a certain extent, having grown up in a family where my, my parents were involved in the, in the industry, it sort of gave me this, um, this need to prove myself, which mm-hmm. now I don't feel at all, but I did feel it. And while that's not a good way to navigate things, feeling like you have to prove everybody wrong, It also provided me with all of the right tools because in deciding to prove people wrong, I wasn't like, I'm just going to prove them wrong. I thought, oh no, I need to prove people wrong. And by proving people wrong, I need to be good. So in order to be good, I need to do the work. And I was never afraid of doing the work. And one thing my parents said to me was, we will open every door that we can for you. But in order to walk through that door and see what's on the other side and be welcomed into whatever room you step into, through those doors, you have to do the work. Because if you don't do the work, and if you don't have the right attitude, and if you don't have the skills and the, and the tools, the door can be open as much as you want it to be. You're never going to walk through it. That's right. And if you do, and, or, people yeah. are going to look at you and go, what are you doing here? Totally. So for me, it's always been about you know, will I take everything that my parents will do to help me? Of course. Also because I love my parents and I, I want to work with them and I want to do all these things, but I also want to do everything I can to be as skilled and, and have as much as possible to bring to the table as I can. Um, and I've learned that not just from my parents, but from some of the remarkable people I've been very, very lucky to work with. One of them being John Reese Davies. He has taught me so much as to what it is to be an actor um, who, who is John Rhys Davies? So John Rhys Davies is most famously known for playing uh, Sala in Lord of. Uh, no, let me rewind. Sala in Indiana Jones, um, the best okay. friend of Indiana or okay. Indy, and he, he's the guy that has the really deep voice, and he goes, "Bad idea, Indy." Okay. 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 Not, okay. Um, not a seventy-year-old man, um, but he's most famous for that and for playing Gimli in Lord of the Rings the dwarf in Lord of the Rings. He was also very famously in Victor and Victoria with Julie Andrews. He's one of those people that has just done everything. And what, everything. what is, what has he taught you and how, how did he teach you? <sighs> so many things. <laughs> I don't know if we've got enough time for that. Is he, um, well, well, give me, give me the, give me the, the, the cream of the crop. What's the best kind of and, and then we'll talk about a tale of love, but I want to, what's, what, tell me one thing. Is he an acting teacher or a friend, a mentor? A friend mentor, but he's, he's a working actor and I've had the privilege of working on four films with him. Um, okay. And aside from acting, the thing that he has taught me is that kindness goes a really long way. And when I say that, I don't mean just being nice to people. It's the little things like John will never complain. He's being paid to do a job that he loves. So he's grateful for every minute he's on set. Mm -hmm. You want him there at five in the morning and you keep him in his trailer until 2 a.m. and you never bring him to set. He won't walk away angry. Wow. He's grateful that he was brought in. His job was to be there, to be available, to do his job. And most notably, so he played Peter in the biblical movie that I did. Um, 
Okay. And so that for me was huge because I mean, the man is incredible, mm. but watching him and Stephen Baldwin, they had um, a scene together. Stephen Baldwin played Nero and, and John Reese Davies played Peter. And watching him, he, he knows who his character is from the inside out. And each word has a feeling. Each word has emotion and history and depth to it. And getting an opportunity to work opposite him and build with him has been one of the greatest gifts I think I've ever been given. He was in Sophie and Sheba, which I did when I was um, 20. And there was a scene I distinctly remember where I'm supposed to get really angry with him. And he's supposed to get really angry with me back. And I, I've been a fan of his my whole life. So I was like really intimidated. And um, he looked at me and he said, my darling, before this scene begins, you have every right to get as angry as you should be. And I was like, I don't quite get that, but okay. <laughs> and then we did the scene and he started yelling as his character. And I realized that when I really let myself be who I was playing rather than be myself opposite this person that I admired, the person I was playing was really, really mad back. Mm. And there was no sense in quieting any of it because it wasn't John yelling at Brittany. It was his character yelling at my character. Right. And my character was just as mad as he was. Mm. So I had to meet him. And, and yeah, anyway, sorry, that was not one. Well, that's beautiful. That's, and you. So long winded. <laughs> did you cast, did you cast him in that? Uh, no, he was, he was cast by, well, my, my parents were involved in that, which was crazy. But my dad, I think was the person who reached out originally to mm. see if he would be willing to come on board. And yeah, we've worked on four projects as a result. And I love him with my whole heart. He's so-, so you just learned a lot from him watching him act and how he approaches the character and also just what mm-hmm. he says to you. It just it feels like just being around yeah. him is the mentorship yeah. of who he is. Yeah. 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 And I think too, like any actor you're around, any person you're around that's in your field, whether you're an actor or anyone, you can learn so much just from watching how they approach what they do, especially if there's someone you admire. Yeah. Um, I had the same thing with Deborah Kara Unger, who was also in Sophie um, with me when I was younger and watching her act was like watching someone prepare right. to win an Oscar. It was <laughs> remarkable. Wow. It's like, what is happening right now? Right. I don't understand. I need to be as good as this. So, mm. but yeah, to, I think just know, learning from the people around you. <laughs> and you said the first thing you said was the kindness and the not complaining mm-hmm. because you know, that uh, will get you, that'll give you longevity in this business too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When people are uh, enjoy, enjoy it's a family that you create when you make these films or these series. So yeah, it's always, people will put up with, with, you know, prima donnas for a little bit, but over time it's just, it just drags down the whole, the whole world. Well, and it's not necessary, you know, it doesn't make, it doesn't make the environment any more fun. It doesn't make it your job any easier. It also doesn't make you any better as an actor. The more vulnerable you are, the kinder you are, the more accepting you are of the people around you, and the more you're willing to listen, mm. the better you are going to be. Because acting, as everyone loves to say, is simply reacting. Reacting. So if you're not listening, you can't react to anything. Yeah, and exactly. And a <laughs> prima donna or someone who's who's complaining all the time, they're probably not listening that much. They're probably just speaking exactly. or like... I was here at 5 a.m. and it's midday and I nobody's used me yet. Yeah. Which we all have been called in 12 hours before our call and be like, why am I here? We're in the trailer going like, I could be buying Christmas presents. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So let's talk about this movie that premieres tonight. I know there's, I just want to get to, and there's a few other questions I have, but, but we'll, um, how did this come together? Obviously your, your mom wrote it. Mm -hmm. Your dad is directing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it. What's the journey of this film? Like how, uh, and it's called The Tale of Love. So, yeah. tale. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and your, your character rescues uh, animals and you meet Chris's mm-hmm. character. But tell me just the genesis of this project. Like where did it come from and how, how did it uh, get to be greenlit? And how did this come together? So my parents have had this story as a, as a functional uh, thing in the back of their minds and sort of on a table for a number of years. They've gone, okay, we want to make this movie. We want to make this movie. 
And finally, my mom said, okay, I'm going to work on the story. I'm going to sort of rewrite it. I'm going to figure out where it needs to live. Um, And once she started doing that, she just got so excited. And my dad started getting excited about it. And then they sort of had this daydream of, wouldn't it be fun if I played Bella and then we could all work on it together. And so eventually, you know, with my dad being the wonderful producer and incredibly skilled man that he is along with my mother who is his co-pilot in all things um Mm -hmm. and equally as skilled (laughs) uh if you know I won't say it but um (laughs) she's she's a remarkable woman let's just put it at that um but the two of them as a team they just thought you know what why waste time let's just do this Mm -hmm. and uh and so they decided to figure out what it would take to to get the funding in place and make it. And so we sort of made it as a little independent piece picture with the idea of hopefully selling it to Hallmark. Um, hopefully they would want to take it on and, and have it as, as a Hallmark film um, so that it could have a home there because we all love Hallmark and, you know, really admire the network. Um, and so we just sort of said, okay, let's just, let's just do this. Let's get it together. And, my parents found a time frame that worked for me um, and worked for them. And it sort of all just, it was like all the puzzle pieces fell into place. And uh, we were really lucky in that we were able to get funding in, in place. And of course, all of that was more my parents. I don't dive into much of that. Right. I mean, I know how to, I just don't enjoy it very much. So I leave it more to them. Right. Um, but yeah. And then we were really excited when Chris said that he wanted to come on board and and the four of us sort of, you know, worked together to, to finesse the characters and figure out exactly how we wanted the story to be presented. And, and it was a really fun, really collaborative experience. And then when the film was finished, Hallmark said, we absolutely want this. And um, so here we are. Here we are. Pretty and exciting. It, <laughs> and it is. And then it premieres tonight Yeah. Uh, at eight o'clock. In five hours. Oh, my gosh. All right. How exciting. I'm How, so did, nervous. So did you sleep last night? Of course you did. That's different. You didn't sleep last night. <laughs> I did not. Uh, I have been awake for the last like week. Oh, my I'm gosh. I'm so nervous. I'm no, sweating profusely at all moments. I am well, so nervous. I'm well, excited, but I'm nervous. I just really want people to love it because I love it so much. I'm sure I'm sure they will. And I'm sure the fans, you know, I, I heard you were live tweeting uh, at four in the morning from your first picture <laughs> when Hallmark was going through one of its darkest uh, moments. And there you were like the only person on Twitter. <laughs> so that yeah. you were, what I, your work ethic and your preparation and your study and your love of the craft is, uh, I think, what sets you apart. And thank you. And, you know, you're so young and and to have thank you so much i don't always feel it i appreciate that (laughs) i I think i have 15 years on you so yes you're very young uh and and just to you know to speaking with your dad yesterday was such a privilege too because uh you know it's 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 so cool to speak to you after speaking to him and and his knowledge and love of filmmaking and just his experience and he was just sharing Mm -hmm. some of the projects that he's been a part of and and the high standard that he holds in, you know, especially around making films in the authentic location where they would probably mm-hmm. be. And the authenticity yeah. is sort of what I got from your dad yesterday, his, his, uh, his respect for filmmaking and, and, the, yeah. and the authenticity of, of having it not just be another one of those films shot in Vancouver or Winnipeg that they're, they're so, it's so obviously that they're shot there that your dad set this high standard and, you can see mm-hmm. that you have a really high standard um, for yourself and how yeah. you carry yourself and and how you present yourself and um, and congratulations on 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 having on having this 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 film come. What what are you most excited about uh, in the film? Is there is there like a scene that you really love, or is there is is there a message to this movie that like what what about this film excites excites you the most that that you want people to know about? I think the thing that ultimately excites me the most about the film is the fact that Bella is somebody who fully realizes who she is. She's not lost. She's not amidst uh, heartbreak. She's not wondering what her next move is. She knows exactly who she is. 
and playing someone who is that set in stone and who she is is really fun. Um, but I think the thing that's most exciting in terms of what people can take away from it is that no matter how set we feel, no how, no matter, no matter what it is we're doing, when we're willing to open up to vulnerability, things can change in really beautiful ways and you learn the most about yourself. And I think all of the characters in this film go through a moment of having to navigate their own vulnerability. Um, the grandmother played by Jane Eastwood, who is incredible. She's amazing. Chris's character, JR, my character, they're all navigating, finding something and facing themselves in a way, you know, they're facing, okay, I know what I want to do. I know that it makes me happy, but is there anything that's missing? And I think that curiosity is what allows us to find the most beautiful parts of our lives because you can be as happy as you want to be, but is there something else you could be doing that could be making your life or someone else's life better? Mm -hmm. Is there something else you could be tacking on? If no, that's also okay. But being open to the vulnerability of exploring what that looks like is huge. And that's something that Bella does in this film. You're, you're, what you're sharing reminds me of there's like a zone of competence and there's a zone of, 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 of uh, there's, there's a zone of excellence where, and then there's a mm -hmm. zone of genius. And so a lot of people live in this zone of excellence where everyone, you know, they're kind of happy and they're doing things that everyone says they're good at and they're, and they're, but they're, if they stayed there forever, they're, her heart would, they would, a little part of them would probably die. This is like their zone of excellence, but it's easy to stay there because everybody tells you that you're, they need you there and you're good there, but there is another place, which is your zone of genius where yeah. all time goes away. And it, it sounds like for you, your dancing at a certain point was your zone of excellence and you could have stayed there, but a part of you would have died. And then there's yeah. this big leap. And it's actually a book called the big leap that I love. Mm that talks about the upper limit problem. And a lot of people get a certain level of success and they sabotage it and they, of how good they're willing to have it. And they like blow mm -hmm. their life up. And it really shares this zone of genius where you can, uh, and what you're talking about with vulnerability makes me think mm -hmm. like, I wonder vulnerability is another key and another doorway to help you find your zone of genius. Mm -hmm. there's, it, it, there's a there's a formula for how to find your zone of genius in this book. It's a gay handbook, yeah. and but I've never thought of vulnerability as being a key to doing some finding something that actually really makes you happy, but happy mm -hmm. in a way that to all time goes away. You would do it for no money. You would like you know and uh, yeah. How do you think? Have you found your zone of genius? Do you think like do you and is that is your thing oh, with man. acting? I don't know. I feel like that's something that's sort of this intangible, like always reaching for in, in my eyes, like you'll, I feel like it's, it's rare that people find it, but I think it's something that, that we should all chase. I think, you know, it's sort of that, that concept of, of reaching for the stars mm -hmm. is that it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it just because yeah. you're going to, you know, land on the moon. <laughs> or what right. is it shoot for the moon and you land amongst the stars i don't know what the yeah. exact saying yeah, is but yeah, just yeah. because just because you're reaching for something even if you get to something else doesn't mean that something else isn't going to be just as great so i think to a certain extent something that you should always be striving for that you should always be pushing yourself for whether it's through education or little things that you do on your day-to-day -day or or whatever that looks like in everybody's independent life um but yeah always pushing for for the best for yourself um, and for the people around you. Mm -hmm. I think it just, it encourages us all to, to keep being a better version of ourselves every day. And but yeah, do I, I don't know if I've reached it, but I think I'll, I'll keep trying. How do you do that without having it stress you out and making sure you can get a good night's sleep? <laughs> <laughs> well, sleeping, sleeping's gone for me. Sleeping said and gone, sadly. Um, but no, I think it's just the little things, you know, they don't have to be big it's, it's, it's little, it's getting excited for me. It's like, if I watch a TV show that I find inspiring why thinking about it for 10 minutes or reading a book by somebody I admire or yeah. smiling at somebody in a grocery store. Like there's all these little things that, that add up to get you there. Mm. Um, 
it's not a, it's not always just about the big things. It's it's all those little pieces along the way too. It is. It is. Yeah. And, and so you said vulnerability. That's one of the things that you really loved about your your character. And then, you know, we've talked, did you read Brene Brown's book, The Power of Vulnerability? Have you read that? I book? haven't, but I have it. You haven't, but okay, you're speaking as if you've read the book. So, so you you have the book, but you haven't read it. And yeah. you're and you're already speaking of vulnerability. That's my <laughs> uh, you're destined to maybe you don't have to, maybe you don't need to read the book. Maybe it's, uh, <laughs> I'm sure I probably do. There's 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 some good there's some good points to that book. So tonight uh on Hallmark and so you're gonna be live tweeting, is that right? I don't yeah, want to put I tweets, am I don't want to put tweets in your mouth that I, I assume. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I will be live tweeting for sure. And how can people like follow you, but also follow the conversation so they can help make this a a big Twitter success, right? You're so, you're so good with knowing all these things. So hashtags. Yeah. Do you have a hashtag? Is there a hashtag? We do. We have, we have the two. So there's a hashtag spring into love. It's the hallmark one. And then hashtag a tale of love. Okay. Great. Yeah. And tail with yeah. T A I L. T A I L. Yeah. yeah. That dog tail. And and how <laughs> and so how do they find you on your social media then? Everybody. Um, so I'm on uh, Twitter and on Instagram at Britt Bristow. B R I T B R I S T O W. Okay. Oh, that, yeah. That's awesome. And what's what yeah. project are you working on uh, next to follow this one up? So I'm actually doing, uh, I don't know how much I can say about it. So I'll say the least amount while still telling you, um, I'm doing, (laughs) I'm working on, uh, actually a film series. So it's four parts, um, about four girlfriends. So, wow. Yeah. So that starts in May. So I'm very excited to start working on that. And where do we, can you share where that's going to be or no? I'm not sure yet. Um, but as soon as I have details, I will be harassing the entire world with that information. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Well, I look, I look forward to uh, this being a huge success. Uh, I Thank know Hallmark's, you so much. Hallmark's really promoting the live and daylights out of it and like, like really pushing it. So that's always a good sign that they love it. And that I'm sure everybody watching here will uh, hop on and tweet with you and help. help oh, I hope this. so. Yeah, help to help make this thing a, a an even bigger success, and um, and thanks for opening up and sharing all these little goodies. These little these little I like learning things that that uh, about like the I like I like learning little things about people that mm-hmm. maybe you know it's it's so fun being an actor and speaking to an actor because I'm actually genuinely interested in like the Larry Moss a little bit about Larry Moss and and yeah it's it's really fun to to actually uh to to speak with you and to learn about um you know what makes you tick a little bit yeah well it was so nice to be here thank you so much for inviting me on I feel so special (laughs) I know you are and everybody go see this movie and uh the all the best to you Brittany and congrats congrats on this may it be there you know, maybe there can and compare and your other films that you've done have been such big successes. So I have no doubt that this is you should you <laughs> could probably have slept just fine. You'll oh, you'll get God. you'll have a good you'll have a good sleep tonight, I'm sure. Thank goodness. I hope so. <laughs> Amazing. Well I'm just gonna sign off here on YouTube and Perfect. say goodbye say goodbye to everybody here on YouTube and I'll uh, just hang on one second Brittany we'll we'll uh, I'll Perfect. say goodbye to you properly here. Sounds great. Um, I'm still live on YouTube. <laughs>